Hello and welcome. Today we are diving into data structures with an introduction to arrays in JavaScript. Let's get started. Let's start working with arrays. Arrays are a data structure in JavaScript, and I'll use the analogy as we start out with an array being something like a shelf that we're going to store things on. And right now I'm just going to build my shelf by defining an empty array. And the array is indicated with those brackets you see. So we've defined my array and it equals an empty array at this point. Now I cannot reassign my array. It's always going to be an array. And you can tell we've used the const keyword to make sure we cannot reassign that just like we couldn't reassign a variable as we use the const keyword. However, the elements inside the array can be reassigned. They are mutable. And so we can add elements to an array by referencing the position they are in in the array. And we do that with the brackets and then we'll put a zero because we start counting at zero just like we do the positions in a string. And so we have my array at the zero position and here I'll assign my name and now on our shelf that is an array, in the one position, we'll assign a number. And then in the next position, we'll assign a Boolean value. So you can see we hold all different types of data in an array. And it's kind of like little storage locations. And you could look at the array as the shelf, as I mentioned, or a briefcase or something like that where we're storing our data. You can actually even nest arrays within arrays. And we'll get to that. Right now, let's look at how we can refer to an array when we want to see it in the console. I'll type console log and I'll just type the name of the array. I'm going to save the file and look at the console. We have a three over there, which indicates the length of the array. So yes, an array does have a length property and you can see the array. So within the brackets, we have our string data, our numeric data and our Boolean data all within the array that has a length of three, as you might guess. So let's take a look at that length property. And we refer to my array dot length as we have with other data before like strings and now we'll save that and you can see we get three in the console it has a length of three and let's look at the last element in an array for example so we'll go last element in an array and we can view that of course I'll type console log then my array and instead of giving a specific number say we don't know how long our array is we can put my array dot length, but just like with a string, it's going to give the, say an R array, it gives the full three count here. We've got three items and it gives a three. However, we start counting at zero. So we have to say my array dot length minus one, because actually our Boolean data is in the two position of the array. I'll save that and you can see in the console, it says on line 16, we've requested the data from the last position of the array and it prints false to the console. And what else? Oh yeah, we can refer to just any one item, kind of like we did there, but we didn't do it specifically. We can refer to any one item of the array with its number. So if we wanted to view whatever was in the one position of our array, we just say my array brackets and the number of the position. And there we go, we get 1001 in the console. One of the first things you may ask is how do we add more data to our array? So let's go ahead and remove these lines and we'll add something to our array. We'll say my array dot push. And now let's put in, oh, let's put in school because school just started and we'll save that of course we didn't log anything to the console yet so let's bring back our array in the console and now that we've pushed that data you can see our array has four items and we added the string school 
in the third position of the array because it counts 0, 1, 2, 3, and it has a length of 4. So how do we remove something from our array? Well, we can say my array dot pop. Now if we log to the console my array one more time, you'll see the second time we log the array to the console, um, it only has the three items again because we popped the last item off of the array. And further, we could define a variable to hold that last item if we wanted it because pop will actually return the last item to us. So we could say const last item equals my array pop. And here we'll put last item instead of my array. And you can see now we have school in the console because last item is equal to the last item that was in the array before we popped it off of the end. We can do the same with the front of the array. So I will remove some lines and instead of push, we'll put unshift and here, well, let's go ahead with numeric data, put the number 42 and unshift, we'll save that. And now notice we've got the number 42 at the beginning of our array when we print it to the console. And what about removing? Oh, I should also mention that sh uh, I said shift, unshift adds to the array at the front. And when we push and add to the array at the end, if we assign variables to those, it is the new length of the array that is returned. So if we put new length in here, you can see now we get four in return. So when we add to the array, the return value is the new length of the array. And so we could also do that with push. And it would be length of four because we start out with an array that has a length of three until we add that new value. And so when we push and unshift, we are adding to the array. And when we pop, we are removing from the end of the array. And as you might guess, when we shift, if I could spell, we are removing from the front of the array. And instead of new length, we will have the first item of the array return to us. And we'll log that to the console this time. And you can see Dave was the first item of the array. We've shifted. And so now when we shift, it does remove that item. And I will show that by logging the array right after this. And now the array only has two items inside of it. When we push items to the end of the array, we're adding a new number. So if we have my array zero through two and we push something to the array, now we have an item in the three position. Likewise, when we pop something off of the end, it's from that last position. It doesn't really change the previous positions that were assigned unless, of course, we don't assign something new and pop off the last one from the end like we could here with the uh, two position but it doesn't change the previous assignments of the position. So a good question would be, what about when we use a shift and remove an item from the front of the array? What about the position of these items? Is 1001 still in position one? Well, let's take a look. My array and we'll put position one log that to the console and it's now false. So that is worth noting that those positions are not locked in. If something is removed, everything shifts to the front. So the zero position would now hold 1001 and the one position would now hold false. And what if we tried to log a position that no longer exists? What will we get in the console? undefined. And of course, trying to do something to uh, undefined, say call a method on something that is undefined, will cause an error. So we have to be prepared for that as well. What if we want to remove an item, an element from the middle of the array, somewhere in there that is not at the beginning or not at the end? Well, let's take a look at that there's a couple of ways to do it, and let's look at one that I will suggest you do not use first, but it does exist. We could say 
delete, and then we would say my array, and let's say we want to delete the value that's in the first position of the array, and we would just say that. And now let's console log my array and see what we get. Notice it says empty, so it doesn't remove that position of the array like you might think. It actually leaves undefined data. And we can see that when we go to the console one more time and say log my array position one to the console. We still have that position, but it is undefined. And once again, uh, if we're not expecting undefined data, that can cause problems if we are trying to manipulate the data in some way that calls a method or something that uh, will not work with undefined. So instead of directly deleting an element from the array with the delete, we can use a method and that method will allow us to remove and replace if we want to elements in the array. And for that we'll call our array, my array, and the method is splice. We tell the splice method where we want to begin, and in this instance I'll say begin in the number one position. So this is where we have our 1001 value stored, and I'll say we want to delete one element from the array at that position, and we'll just stop right there. We'll save our file, and you can see now our array, when it's logged to the console, it just has two elements, and the element or value in the one position is no longer 1001, but it is false that used to be in the two position and it moved back to that first position, which is actually the second position. I know that gets confusing, but we go zero and then one. And so you can use the splice method to do that. We could also use the splice method to replace that value or replace several values if we wanted to. So in this instance, we'll say we're just going to replace that first value. If we wanted to replace, uh, say, the first and second position values, we could put a two there. But we'll just put one again, and we want to replace it with something else. And let's say we want to replace it with the number 42, so that's what we'll put. And we'll save that. And now you can see our array has three elements and instead of 1001, it has the number 42 in that position. So splice can be used to delete, splice can be used to replace. If we don't want to delete any values in our array, we can just put a zero in the second parameter. Again, we're still telling splice where we want to start. So this still starts at the first position, but we are not deleting any of the elements in the array, and we're going to go ahead and insert one element with the value of 42. We save that and we get 42 in front of the number 1001 that was previously in the one position and now 42 is in that position of the array. Let's look at some more array methods. Right now I'll delete all of this and I'm going to just put some values in our array because it's easier to see when you know you have consecutive values what we're comparing. So I'll just do the ABCs in our array for a few letters. And we'd probably be good to stop after this one. There we go, A, B, C, D, E, F is what is in our array. We save that, we don't have anything logged to the console, and we're ready to check out the slice method on arrays. So if we say myArray.slice, and we tell it to start in the second position, and that's all we do, uh, we better set a variable equal to this because it is going to return a new array and then we will log that to the console and we'll see what our new array holds when we start slicing at the second position and that's what happens so we're at zero for a one for b and two which is where we started the slice and our new array starts at two and it goes to the end because we didn't tell it where to stop. The second parameter we could add would be telling it where to stop. And let's say let's stop at the fifth position, which it will not include that, whatever is at the fifth position. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. Our new array should now not include F, it should just be C, D, E. Let's save 
and that's what we get in the console. So that is the slice method. Now let's look at the reverse method. And that would just be my array and just say reverse and we'll log my array. It does not create a new array. And now we have the exact same array, but it has been reversed. So now it starts with F and ends with A. The next method we'll take a look at is the join method. And yeah, let's do join. Okay, join is going to take my array and it's going to create a new string using the join method and we will log this new string to the console. And you can see it takes each one of the elements in the array and it puts commas between them, but it has created a string out of all of the elements in the array. The next method we'll take a look at is actually a string method. So let's take this new string We've already created new string and we will split the string and we tell it what we want it to split on and we're going to say split on those commas because you can see in the console our string has a well a comma between each value so we want to split it based on that and this is going to actually create a new array so we'll log the new array And we're back with that array we started with. So you can see we can take an array, turn it into a string. The string will be comma delimited by default. And then we can split a string based on a value in the string. And the new array will not include whatever we split on. And there we split on commas. So it, the commas in this array are just to separate the elements. They're not part of the values of the array. So now let's split our array, uh, my array, into let's call it my array A, and we'll stop that array at C. And then I'll, there we go, I'll create a my array B, and it will hold our DEF values. Then we want to create a new array. We'll get rid of all of this for now, and we'll have my array a dot concat my array b. And then we want to log to the console the new array that is created. And we have our larger array again. So you can see that concat method joins two existing arrays and we can let's do the opposite of this and this would help you see it even more because it really didn't change from the previous array I had logged there. So if I do this now you can see our array is DEF ABC because we put my array B in the first position and called the concat method on it and then passed in my array A as the parameter and it joined those two arrays into one using the concat method. There is a newer way to do this though. Instead of using the concat method, we can use what is known as the spread operator. And we'll use the spread operator to create a new array, just like we're defining a new array. So that would be a blank array. The spread operator is three dots. So we'll put my array A, and then we'll once again use the spread operator and put my array B. What the spread operator does is it tells the array to not put itself in there. Like we're not putting in, we're not creating a new array that has two elements and each of those elements are arrays. We're creating a new array that has six elements because the spread operator says take the values in the array 
and spread them out to be individual elements. And so this should once again equal a new array that has the values of A, B, C, D, E, F. And we'll save this and you can see in the console that's what we got. If we didn't have the spread operator there, we'll remove those. And once again the spread operator is uh, three dots. We would just have a new array that had two nested arrays, my array A and my array B. Let's take a look at how that looks. And now in the console that looks completely different. You can see our new array has a length of two and it contains a nested array with a length of three and another nested array with a length of three. So that is completely different than if we use the spread operator to actually pull those individual values out of each array and join them together in this new array. And there you see the result using the spread operator. Before we can finish our discussion on arrays, we need to come back to nested arrays and how to access values from single dimensional arrays like we have been doing, uh, say then multi-dimensional arrays. So we can have a nested array or a array nested in a nested array even. And of course the rabbit hole could go deeper, but we won't go any further than at least a couple of uh, dimensions into it. Let's look at this and I'm going to copy and paste something in because it would take me just a little bit too long to set the whole thing up typing and you would probably get bored watching that. So let's start out with, uh, I'll move that one. Let's start out with equipment shelf A and equipment shelf B. So we have two arrays here with sporting goods equipment. The first array has baseball, football, volleyball. The second shelf has basketball, golf balls, tennis balls. And then we have clothing shelves, shelf A and shelf B as well. And there's clothes on both of those shelves. Now, as we've been doing throughout this tutorial, if we want to, say, access just one value from a single dimension of this array, which is what we have here is a single dimension, we'll have equipment shelf A, and then we want to access, let's say, football. It's in the first position and logging to the console is all that would take. Or we could log some clothes and we could say close shelf B and we'll go ahead and access what's in the first position there. Oh, let's access uh, tank tops or sweat tops. They're in the uh, zero position of shelf B. Just so we're not accessing the same position from both. And we'll save that and we get football and sweat tops logged to the console. That is a single dimension. But what if there was another dimension added on to this? And let's do that as these two different uh, types of arrays, or not types, but two different things we have. We've got sporting goods equipment and we've got sporting goods clothes, sporting clothes. So those are both in their own departments. So let's go ahead and create arrays for those departments. And I will paste that in. So we have our equipment department now, and that has equipment shelf A and shelf B. We have our clothes department, and that has clothing shelf A and shelf B. And we have created separate departments for each of those, so we have separate arrays. Now those are nested arrays within uh, another array. So you have the equipment department as an array, and it holds two arrays. And then you have closed department as an array and it holds two arrays. So let's take a quick look at that. And I left something, oh, typo. There we go, semicolon. So now you can see we are logging these uh, single items here and then underneath that we have our arrays and both of these arrays hold items. So if we don't want to log the full array here, how would we log those same items? Let's say once again we want to log football but we're starting at the equipment department. We're not at the shelf yet. So the first thing we have to do is indicate uh, which position holds the shelf we need. And that was shelf A, so that is the zero position. So that indicates the shelf, and now we indicate where the item is, or the element of the array. So this will once again log football to the console, but you see how we had to go another level deeper with the positioning. Let's do the same with the closed department. So that was on shelf B, 
So that was in the number one position. And then we logged sweat tops, which was in the zero position of that uh, shelf. Save that. And once again, we get football and sweat tops logged to the console, but you can see we had to add one extra bracket to uh, tell it that extra position. So we identified the uh, shelf and then we identified the item we wanted from the shelf. And we did that the same with the clothes department. Now let's add one more level. That was a two dimensional array. We had a nested array, but what if we go three dimensions and we put our whole store that has our equipment department and clothing department into an array of its own. Paste that in. There is our sports store and it has the equipment department and the clothes department. And from there, we want to log those same items. But at first, I'll just log the sports store. And you can see it is an array that holds two arrays and it tells you those arrays are holding two items. It doesn't say that they're holding arrays inside there, except they are, but we don't see that at this point in the console. We just know the two uh, items or two elements in our sports store array are arrays and both of those arrays also have lengths of two for whatever they're holding. So now in our sports store, if we want to start at the very front door of the store and then identify the department. The equipment department was in the zero position of the sports store. And then from there, our equipment shelf that had the football was in the zero position of the equipment department. And then we went to, oops, I didn't put the brackets. And then we went to the item on the shelf we wanted. And that added our third dimension to get the same result. And that should once again send football to the console. Now let's go ahead and find a way to also send sweat tops to the console as we have before. And so now this is in the clothes department. And so that is in the first position. And then we went to clothing shelf uh, B. So that is also in the first position. And then we went to the zero position for sweat tops. And that is our three dimensional uh, way of getting at sweat tops when we start at the very front door of our sports store. And you can see once again, we get the same values logged to the console, but we had to go further into those nested arrays and that was a three-dimensional uh, array layout there because we start with a large array and it holds two arrays and each of those arrays holds two more arrays. So you go a little further down the rabbit hole in getting that information, but it is important to know how to get that information that you need out of arrays. And so these are things that are worth practicing as you move forward with arrays. Hi, I'm Dave, and I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Remember to keep striving for daily progress instead of perfection. Subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to be alerted when I post new tutorials. I'll see you next time.